All right, so yes. I'm going to just go through some introductions and welcome everybody. Keep it short. Nobody yeah. cares. Nobody cares. <laughs> no. well, I want to welcome all of you to the Arden Scholars Guild. Um, this is uh, the meeting for May, and we're thrilled to have Joe Francis here. Before we introduce him, I want to just say that um, donations are welcome. I see many of you have already done it. If you haven't signed in, please do so we get an idea of our numbers. Um, other than that, I want to mention that all of our speak, all of our talks are welcoming, open, and we'd like to think that we are accepting to all genders, races, colors, and uh, we would like to have uh, respectful questions from the audience. And if at some point someone feels uncomfortable or uh, something gets out of hand, I guess I will. I will grab his cane and pull you out, yeah, <laughs> by the neck. <laughs> so our speaker tonight is a friend of mine, Joe Francis. And neighbor. And neighbor, that's right. He or both city residents. Um, his professional life is with the Veterans Administration at the federal level, right? Um, but um, his avocation is natural history. And I know him in the birding community. We met at the Hawk Watch at Ashland Nature Center. And we have worked on some, done some birding together. In fact, last week he led my walk at Alapocus, uh, which, which I couldn't lead. But I also found out that he knows a lot about plants and is a lover and has been looking at medicinal plants, which is, combines his love of medicine and his love of nature. So without further ado, right. it's all yours. Very good. I'm gonna put this here and hopefully it's close enough so you can hear me. Um, so I do have a confession to make. Um, I'm not a botanist, uh, so I'm an avocational plant lover. Uh, I don't even garden, so I don't have even that basics. Uh, I live in a condominium, and thank God that other people do this work for me. Um, and I'm not an herbalist, um, and I'm not going to talk about... Okay, got it. Thank you for mentioning that. In fact, I can raise it up. Okay, is that better? Oh, oh my gosh, okay, good. I can hear, hear myself bouncing off the back wall. Um, so I'm not an herbal medicine practitioner and I'm not gonna cover things through a perspective that an herbalist might take. Part of the reason is um, I respect the fact that they have years of training. This is not something that they, what they do, you cannot get from simply reading a book. And I think that goes true also for understanding the use of medicinal plants through the lens of the American Indian, through our, you know, our original inhabitants for this area would be the Lenni Lenape. Uh, I did a chant, I did a field uh, trip with uh, Dennis Coker, who's the, uh, uh, I guess he's considered the principal chief of the Nanticoke Lenape community based in Cheswold, just north of Dover. He did a, a trip a few years ago at Alapocus, and it was a wonderful opportunity if you ever have a chance to do that and see similar material through a different perspective, it is well worth it. Uh, I'm doing this because I wanna get people who the like outdoors excited about plants. Uh, my birding colleagues tend to pass plants by. Uh, they probably know the trees, like the warbler is in the black cherry or the white oak. Um, but they won't necessarily know the plants uh, in the herbaceous layer, the substory. I was at a, uh, belong to the local bee watching club. So George and Nancy are here. And I remember several people saying there, oh, I don't do plants. Um, so for me, it was a similar experience. And the hook to understand the plants was getting to them through what I knew best from my decades of training, which was understanding medicinal uses and then tying that to their ecology. And then the other hobby that I've had since actually pre-med was history. Um, there are a lot of things that you can be frustrated about in today's world. Uh, there are a lot of things that we physicians grumble about every day. History at least provides the perspective that we've always been screwed up and we've somehow managed to survive. 
And so that's also the lens we're going to look at some of these things. And I'm going to blend it all together, uh, hopefully in about 45 minutes, just enough to give you a taste. Uh, tomorrow, those of you that are available, I'm going to lead a walk at 9 o'clock at the Brandywine Creek uh, State Park Nature Center. Uh, they have a lovely pollinator garden. And I'll just say that the same chemistry that attracts pollinators is also the same chemistry that creates medicines. It's all tied. In fact, one of the books that I used in preparation for this talk, the subtitle is Perfumes, Poisons, and Pigments. Again, all of these things are connected. From the plant's perspective, it's doing what it needs to do to survive. And it's not trying to de determine what medicines you need. But uh, that, that trip will be geared towards beginners. So if you've never identified plants, if you don't know how to use a hand lens, uh, we'll go through that, just some basic field skills. I'll show you the type of tools that I use, both online and uh, in print, to help identify things in the field. And, and, and I'm just still a student, so you'll be a student with me and hopefully can take some skills out from that to your future nature walks. Okay, so um, whenever you pick up a book on medicinal plants, um, they usually have at the very first page, a page of disclaimers written by a lawyer and incredibly frightening. It's like, this is not FDA approved. If you choose to read beyond this page, you are accepting the risks. I'm not gonna go that far, but I'm simply gonna say, I won't give any health advice today, uh, either personal or general. Uh, except for two things, one of which I'm going to say shortly, and then the last I reserve for the end. Uh, I'm not a fan of foraging. Um, I think there are parts of the country we you can get away with foraging, but in terms of um, how habitats are under stress today, um, it is a bad thing to do in our part of the country. Um, and there are many cases of where you know plants have been foraged and poached and environment irreparably changed because people were going after something like ginseng or black cohosh uh, because of their known medicinal properties. Uh, I'll also tell you that um, what you get out of the ground, you may not be able to trust in terms of its potency. Uh, it may be unpredictable. Uh, it, there may be higher than you expect or less than you expect, depending on the conditions it grew and also how you prepare the plant. And again, that's why you want, if you are going to seek herbal medicinal modalities, you want to go to somebody with that experience. And that to me, you know, was summarized uh, by Hippocrates long ago. Hippocrates spoke Greek, but somehow the phrases in Latin are as long a beauty brevis. Um, it takes a long time to learn these things and life is short. My one, my first piece of health advice, though, is if you happen to use a medicinal or herbal supplement or remedy, uh, and that includes cannabis, which is now legal for recreational and medicinal uses, do let your doctor know. These drugs are potent. They have effects, and they also interact with other drugs. Um, just a few weeks ago in the Journal of the American Medical Association, there was a uh, report about interactions between cannabis and anesthesiology. And so uh, if you think about it, um, you know, there are thousands of chemicals in the cannabis plant. Uh, many of them have sedative effects. If you are a habitual user, your body habituates, your liver revs up the enzymes that break those sedatives down. What do they give during anesthesia? Sedatives. If your body is revved up, it's going to clear those compounds more quickly. And there were cases reported of people waking up in the middle of surgery, completely unexpected, because the anesthesiologist wasn't making the necessary adjustments. And there's also opposite times. If you come in and there's a, a cannabis load in your bloodstream, uh, the added sedative effects could have the, the opposite effect, where you have prolonged uh, sedation and difficulty weaning off of the anesthesia and probably a longer and more expensive stay uh, in the hospital as a result. So let your doctor know um, a decade or so ago when I, you know, I experienced many of my colleagues had a just dismissiveness about people who took medicinal supplements 
um, herbal supplements and the like. And uh, I just say, if your physician is of that ilk, you probably should find someone that's more accommodating uh, because I, we've been trained and taught to ask about this in a sensitive way and, and respect the fact that this is what people do. One thing to talk about, my lens is really one of the ecology, and uh, this surprised me when I came across the article. You know, we love the, the sites that are spectacular for nature. You know, we read about the Amazon, we go to Florida, we go to the Southwest and Big Bend. Uh, we're actually living in a biodiversity hotspot here in Delaware. Uh, and this was actually formally listed. Uh, it's the 36th <laughs> uh, biodiversity hotspot in the world, the North American coastal plain, which is the region that I'm gonna be focusing on for the plants we're, we will discuss. Um, there are across this region over 1800 species of plants that are endemic. So they're only found in this part of the world and nowhere else. Uh, and also unique fish, amphibians, reptiles, breeding birds. Of course the birds migrate, but the ones that breed here are 51 of them are unique, mammals, uh, this is a landscape that's under threat. Over 85% is developed. People do like coastal property, even though uh, they should know that in 20 or 30 years, they will be underwater, literally, not just figuratively. And uh, this is also a landscape that's fire adapted. This is part of the problem with finding plants uh, that have medicinal properties or other unique ecological roles because you need fire. Uh, one of the best field trips that I ever took um, was to the New Jersey Pine Barrens. The Pine Barrens basically have the same kind of habitat, fire adapted habitat as the coastal plain in Delaware. But there's more preservation of the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. And we were on a military base. And this was right after 9-11. Um, and we had, in, we had invaded Iraq and um, they were doing uh, military flights with the A-10s, you know, the slow flying jets that are tank killers. And uh, we were we were looking for Pine Barrens gentian and, and we found it uh, right next to a couple of spent shell casings uh, because the live fire exercise was what was creating essentially the, the natural habitat to which these plants were adapted. Um, and so if you, again, see uh, burning that's happening, uh, controlled burns, uh, accept that. Um, you know, there obviously can be some controversy when that happens close to habitation, but if we want to preserve our native ecology, we have to have fire. And that's a very, very hard sell. Um, I remember even growing up, uh, I grew up in old Newcastle and they used to periodically uh, burn the, the marshes. And that was one way to keep Phragmites under control. People don't like to do that much anymore. And one year that they burned the Phragmites, an ember landed on Emanuel Church. And you all, you all remember when Emanuel Church burned down? I think it was like 1980. Um, so they use Roundup now for Phragmites control, which probably is not better for the environment, but at least it's more accepted. Okay. Something about the history of plants and medicines. Um, I don't know whether these figures are right. They're in the literature and I try to go back to the primary sources and all they do is quote each other, but something like 28,000 plant species have recorded medicinal uses. Um, many of these are threatened and over 1,280 are listed in the convention of the International Trade for Endangered Species. So these are the guys that stop you at the borders. And if you have that plant, you go to jail because you're not supposed to be trading in them. So. Uh, again, a lot of rarities here. Um, again, a figure that's quoted, something like 40% of currently prescribed drugs have a plant-derived component. Um, there's a lot that's going on these days with, with drug discoveries and a lot um, requires genomic tools and synthetic biology, but you have to start with some idea where you wanna go. And usually the idea is what people gain from nature. Uh, Something I thought was very interesting is since 1981, two thirds of the new small molecule cancer drugs come from natural products. And what do I mean by small molecule? Uh, the big molecules are things like monoclonal antibodies or messenger RNA, or uh, these polypeptide, these small protein molecules that are you know, huge polymers. Uh, 
and they're hugely expensive. We call them generically biologics. They're the ones that cost $100,000 a year to keep you going. Uh, but the, the other drugs that are not these huge uh, polymers, most of them are coming from plant-derived materials. Uh, some of these drugs also uh, are being used for conditions that we are worrying about at our age, uh, like loss of memory. So if you go to uh, Winterthur and you admire the snowdrops that are coming up in March on the March bank, uh, that's genus is, um, I think it's galantamus, and galantamine is a derivative of that. Uh, a, a calabar bean, which is a um, tropical plant, uh, we get the drug rivastigmine from. Uh, and these are both drugs that are used as memory enhancers. Uh, long tradition, um, I, as, as long as we've been human, we've used plant-derived medications and likely um, in the pre-human era. Uh, one of the papers I came across showed that bumblebees that are infected with different types of worms will seek out plants that have a high concentration of nicotine. Nicotine is in lots of different plants, not just tobacco. And so they'll preferentially go to take, take the nectar to knock down uh, the worm infestation that they have in their guts. Um, but you know, Indian uh, medicine, Ayurvedic, Chinese traditional medicine, in the classical world, um, the herbalists were called rhizotomy. Tomo from cut, rhizo, like rhizosphere, or the roots. Uh, and um, the other term that I just think is wonderful to understand the history of this is the term pharmakos in classical Greek. Uh, it had three meanings. Uh, it could be a cure. It could be a poison or a sacrificial victim. And like when, when they threw Iphigenia off the, off the cliff to uh, get the favorable winds to sail to Troy. Uh, so that was a pharmakos. Uh, and there's a little irony here. I mean, if you think about the first people to take any drug, you know, the guinea pigs, they may be a sacrificial victim too. Uh, and that was where we got the saying that the dose made the poison, because there really is a continuum here. So the people that work with plants is to prepare them as medicines, uh, traditionally called apothecaries. Uh, by the way, there's a difference between an apothecary and a druggist, in, at least in the English language. An apothecary was where you went to because you couldn't afford a physician. It was, it was a bit like going to the CVS Minute Clinic. Okay. And um, they did some diagnosis. They kind of did primary care uh, and they did the collection, the drying and the preparation of the plant. The druggist, by contrast, was where the physician went. And they did things kind of on the wholesale level. The druggists evolved to become the big drug companies. And so there is a little bit of a tension between apothecaries and druggists. And in Britain, at least, the apothecaries evolved into what we call general practitioners, GPs. So they don't do the surgery uh, and then some decades ago, at the turn of the 20th century, they gave up compounding their own drugs. And again, they, they sort of farmed that out to uh, industry to do. But this is basically how things were done from you know classical times or even prehistoric times to um, the beginning of the 20th century. You'd have to collect the plant, uh, generally uh, the root or tuber, sometimes the leaves. You had to dry it. And drying was a very delicate process um, because technically when you dry a plant, you're getting the water out of it and the med medicinal compounds are becoming more concentrated. But if you don't dry it properly, you inactivate the drug. So this is where a lot of that in sort of variability in dosing came from. And then you did an extraction. And here's a, a picture out of um, actually an Islamic text um, from the 13th century. Um, and this is just as valid for the 19th century apothecary. Um, you can see the plants are there. There's an urn of, uh, I would assume just some pure water. Uh, this thing here is the way I, I prepare coffee in the morning. I use a funnel drip system. Okay, so you pour the, the warm water over the, the leaves or the ground up roots. Uh, that would be called an infusion. Um, 
or if you prefer your coffee made in a percolator, anybody still use a percolator where it just sort of boils, you boil the heck out of it, and it, uh, that would be called a decoction. You've probably seen these terms and wondered what they were when you read medicinal texts. And then um, if you did a, uh, if you just ground it up and did a cold infusion, um, and some people do make like cold infusion coffees or cold infusion teas. By the way, that is a medicinal activity because originally tea and coffee were used for medicinal purposes. The caffeine has a number of medicinal effects. Uh, that was the basic approach. Uh, or you could juice it up. Um, you've heard of plasters probably if you've read the old text. Uh, that was just mashing up uh, a decoction, a very concentrate, and you lay it out on the skin after it, it cools off. A poultice was often used for wound care, and that was just a bunch of plant materials that were um, softened up and laid on the skin. And, and that made actually a lot of sense because plant materials will have antibiotic compounds and they will keep the wound from becoming infected and they will also keep the wound moist. The worst thing you can do for a skin wound or a skin ulcer is to have it dry out. You want a moist area so that the, the stem cells of the skin can grow in and fill, fill the wound. And then um, lastly, uh, if you couldn't get the medications out with water, uh, because many plant compounds are oil, hydrophobic, they're oil-based, they, you need something else like alcohol or mineral oil. Uh, and you've probably heard of these things called tinctures. Did you ever have tincture of iodine in your medicine cabinet? Uh, tincture of opium, otherwise known as laudanum. If you read Sherlock Holmes stories, you'll, or Agatha Christie, you'll, you'll hear about those. So that's the preparation. And this all fit in really until, again, um, the beginning of sort of scientific medicine and bacteriology at the late 19th, early 20th century into a humoral model of disease. Um, so you know about like the four elements. You have, you know, air and earth and fire and water. And they had associations with body humors. So a uh, fire was associated with bile. Earth was associated with black bile. I have no idea what black bile is. But if you have too much black bile, you are melancholic. Colic is bile. And melan, like melanic, or mel is black. So, um, by the way, black bile was probably somebody having an upper GI bleed and vomiting because the acid in the stomach makes your red blood cells turn black. And that may have been what was happening at that time, but we won't speak any more of that. Uh, winter was the time for phlegm. So that was the water piece. And then uh, the spring, the blood is flowing um, and that's air and that was, oh, these are all associated, by the way, with astrological signs. So Jupiter, Mars, Venus, Saturn. And um, the textbooks of medicine at the time, which by the way, were not just textbooks of medicine, but they may have been actually recipe books. We would call these things nutraceuticals, would talk about compounds in that regard. So if you ever use the term, I'm cute, cool as a cucumber, that what it comes from. And that was literally uh, in this particular Islamic text. Uh, and you can see the cucumber there. And uh, that might be something that you would use if someone is having a fever because you're counteracting the, the opposite. Uh, and uh, I love the one about eggplant. Um, we have a few people that might be younger, so pardon, but uh, there they are consorting in the garden after taking an eggplant. An eggplant was considered the uh, an aphrodisiac. It made you hot. Um, if, if you had a cold in the winter, too much phlegm, you wanted to counteract that, you would, might, if, if you were living in the Islamic world, you might take chickpeas. That was, those were considered dry foods. And if you've ever made hummus, have you ever noticed how much water or lemon juice or olive oil you have to pull in because otherwise it becomes this really dry concrete like mix. And you know, onion and the moistness with the tears should go without saying. So that was, again, the explanatory model. And we adopted that in America in the colonial times. 
Uh, the other thing that is important to talk about is this thing called doctrine of signatures, which was that um, to our benefit, the creator or whomever, the great spirit, put into the plant a clue as to what it was good for. And so if you ever looked at a walnut, it looks a little bit like the brain. And so guess what? It's it's good for brain disorders. And to tell you that this is true, even today, there, there's, a, there's a journal of natural products. And a couple of weeks ago, they had an article from Barcelona where they gave walnuts to high school students. And it's a funny article with all kinds of problems and its analysis, but they said one thing that, that the high school students had was better attention. You know, and, and every high school student looks like they have a little bit of ADHD, but they were better behaved. They said they were psychologically and mentally more mature. I have no idea whether that's due to the walnuts or maybe because while they're eating the walnuts, they're eating less sugar, but that was the finding and it got a fair amount of press. That was a hint, a signature. Um, Tomorrow, we're going to see a plant called Boneset, uh, which is a uh, in the aster family. It's Eupatorium perfoliatum. And you'll see that the leaves are joined at the stem. And so that was a clue that this could be good for healing bone fractures, hence the name. Uh, hepatica, uh, a plant that's getting really hard to find these days. I don't know, do, do you guys have any hepatica? Probably you're growing it in your garden here. You have some in the woods. They're very, very good because that's, again, one of those plants that the deer love to eat. Uh, the the three-sided leaf, uh, three-part leaf, looks a little bit like a liver. It takes a little bit of imagination, but if you turn it over, it's sort of purpley. That's from anthocyanin pigments. And then Ryan did people of the liver, so therefore it was good for liver disease. And then uh, a plant that was in bloom is no longer in bloom, but we may find the uh, uh, the leaves of it, uh, toothwort, dentaria lacinulata, was good for toothaches. And that's because the leaves had that toothing there. Now, were they really that stupid back then uh, to believe this? Uh, there have been some historians that have come back and said, it really wasn't the case that someone looked at the plant and said, oh, it looks like a brain, therefore I'm going to use it for headaches or because my child is immature and needs to grow up. Uh, it was probably the doctrine of signatures this author argued was more of a mnemonic device because you you didn't have printed textbooks there were a lot of things to learn and so you used anything you could to jog the memory and we had all kinds of outlandish mnemonic devices in medical school when we were memorizing things most of which i cannot repeat so but anyway, by, by the way, uh, if any of you are curious about my assertions, uh, you know, send me an email. I, I left it on the sheet here. I, I can send you the primary literature if, if you want to pursue this further. Okay, so let's turn to America. And what I would say is America has always been a very contentious place. There is nothing new about our polarization. In fact, probably what's different is that for a period of time from World War II through maybe a, a couple of decades ago, we were nice to each other. We argued often vehemently, um, and there were factions in American botany and American medicine, and even between America and Europe. That last thing is no surprise, of course. So uh, you know, I say say a few things here just to put things in context. One is, um, has anybody been to Bartram's Garden? Excellent. Most crowds have, that I've talked to never heard of it. Uh, it's a wonderful place to visit. If you haven't been there, go there. Uh, the neighborhood looks a little dicey. Let me assure you it's safe. And it's a wonderful place. It's free. And it is green space for the residents there. And I see a lot of people utilizing it, including from the neighborhood. But Bartram was basically sent here. Um, he was under commission from a guy named Peter Collinson, who was a plant importer. And essentially, this was commerce. This was extraction. He wasn't here for the good of the plants. He wasn't here because he was a nature child. He was here to make money. People came here and it was extractive. And that's kind of coming out in the more modern historical depictions of our first botanist. The first book I got about botany uh, and exploration was called Gentle Conquest. As if, you know, the gentle conquest, as if the botanists were nice, gentle people 
gentle conquest, like, you know, we conquered the land, but then the botanists came and we were, they were all sweet and wonderful. Uh, the more recent retelling of, of what you might call the Colombian exchange uh, is called uh, Plants and Empire. And uh, it was pretty nasty, uh, including, um, you know, we, you know, the colonial powers would take plants from elsewhere and put them somewhere else. Hence our problem with invasives. Hence things like the opium war. So it, it, this was not nice. The other thing to understand is that when people first came to the United States, um, Europeans thumbed their noses at us. There was a famous French botanist and naturalist. It was the sort of contemporary of Linnaeus, the Comte de Buffon. And if you visit the Jardin de Plantes in Paris, that was his place. He was essentially the first curator. And he thought our fauna and flora were degenerate. This was kind of, you know, the beginnings of sort of, you know, racial theory, you know, racial superiority. We, we Europeans are superior in every way. Our plants are better, our animals are better, we are better. And uh, naturally, um, the Americans pushed back at that. And two of the foremost were Jefferson and Franklin, uh, playing up the value of American plants, sending them to Europe, uh, by the way, uh, as a form of revenge, Jefferson sent a beautiful plant that makes berries in the fall with, with the birds love to eat and has beautiful red foliage. And it was planted and grew in the Jardin de Plantes with poison ivy. So, and, uh, you know, on, on, on the side of animal populations, uh, this is why Jefferson made such a big deal of finding the mammoth. You know, when the mammoth was just uncovered, I, there, there were several mammoth findings in, New, in upstate New York around Newburgh and then Kentucky and then elsewhere. And then of course, the Lewis and Clark expedition. The idea was to basically show Europe that we had great plants, great animals. And that's what it was about. Now on the medical side, um, you had factions as well. Um, there was a school of medicine, which was called heroic, which meant that if you were sick, we would bleed you, we would purge you, purge you uh, we would basically mean give you stuff to either make you vomit or to give you diarrhea uh, in order to counteract. And then if you weren't getting better, we just had to hit you harder. Benjamin Rush was the exemplar of that school. Uh, he killed George Washington. George Washington died of strep throat, but really he died of the fact that he was bled to death probably completely exsanguinated, thanks to Benjamin Rush. Um, the counterpart of that were the practitioners that followed a botanic approach. Um, a traditionally trained, Western trained physician was David Hossack. There's a recent biography of him that got, a, I believe, a Pulitzer Prize a few years ago. Uh, he was up in New York. He worked years to finally establish a medicinal plant garden for the Columbia School of Medicine. Uh, which by the way is lying underneath Rockefeller Center today. You can still find the plaque there, but it's a fascinating story. He treated Alexander Hamilton's son who was suffering from, I, I think at the time it was probably measles, simply with plants. There is no plant that can cure measles, but the simple fact that he didn't bleed or purge Hamilton's son meant the sun could heal naturally. And as a result, you were better off in the 19th century seeing an herbalist than you were a traditionally trained physician. And much of that, I think, explains the attitudes that people have today. Uh, medicine still has retained sort of an edge of brutality, which is unfortunate because, you know, the lack of trust is what leads people to say no to things like vaccination and other types of therapies. And, you know, that's, but this is going back into history. There were literally duels. There was a duel between Francis Drake who started the, the first medical school uh, west of the Appalachians in Cincinnati between him and an herbalist. So shots were fired. And so that's how bad it was. A uh, couple of things also, because we liked the European plants better, we tended to import them from Europe. 
Um, but then a couple of things happened. First was the lead up to the War of 1812 and something called the Embargo Act, where you basically couldn't trade with Europe, couldn't trade with England, which sort of forced us to pay attention to our own plants and their value. Because remember, um, we didn't think much about the American Indian at the time. They were someone you basically kicked off the land so you could homestead. Um, and then a group that stepped in to actually help propagation of plants were the Shakers. I, I used to think that Shakers made their money with furniture. Uh, they actually were the first to put seeds in packets. So they were like the predecessor to the Burpee Seed Company and they made their money to selling plants. So a little bit of the history there. Um, something that came in the news a few weeks ago when uh, the whole discussion, the Supreme Court case about mifepristone and oral abortifacients, um, they mentioned that Ben Franklin actually published uh, articles about how to induce an abortion using plants. And actually here it, it is. He This was a multi-purpose textbook. It was kind of a combination of uh, learn your arithmetic and spelling. Here's your home recipes. And also if you couldn't afford a doctor, here are some herbal remedies. And so um, there's this, section in there called suppression of the courses. How many people have heard of the term, the curse for menstruation? It's not meant to be like a, a curse from a demon. It's, it's a mispronunciation of courses. Courses with the term, we don't like to talk about menstruation, period. And uh, what's the most common reason for menstruation? Stopping pregnancy. And as it turns out, some of the more recent, um, mostly feminist historians who have been looking at this, there's a whole history and knowledge of plants that have abortifacient properties. It wasn't talked about. It wasn't written about. In fact, there's a term called agnotology, like agnosis. I don't want to know about it. We don't speak about this, but it was in whispers, you knew who to go to. It was, it was typically a woman practitioner. If they got in trouble with the law, they were typically branded as a witch. Or you went to a, a, an American Indian woman practitioner and you obtained medications. In Franklin's write-up, interestingly, all, the, all the, the plants he lists are actually European imports. We didn't trust the native plants because of that. And so, um, and if, if you're interested in this article, I, I can send it to you. But um, during the debate about mifepristone and misoprostol that we've had recently, um, the Annals of Emergency Medicine published a review of herbal abortifacients. During the time when those drugs were not available, people routinely sought out herbal cures native plants, plants like plants you've heard of, like may apple or black cohosh or blue cohosh. And because you couldn't regulate the dose, I mean, mifepristone is one of the safest, most tested medications on the planet and its dose is standardized. People will turn to alternatives if they don't have safe venues. And so regardless of your opinion about abortion legalization, if you have a harm reduction perspective, this is important. And so we're all sensitizing ourselves now to the possibility that this may come up again. Um, how do we get interested in native plants? It turned out it was the Civil War and it was the Confederates because they, the blockade kept them from gaining access to uh, uh, drugs from Europe. It was a physician, actually one of the founders of the AMA. He was himself a slave owner, Francis Porche. He was a Huguenot. He was a, probably a little sickly kid, and he spent a lot of his time with his mother growing up, learning the plants. He spent time with the slaves. They taught him things. He got to have some relationship with the American Indians living in his port, part of uh, South Carolina. And so when the Confederacy needed a a uh, pharmaceutical armamentarium, they turned to him to produce a compendium. And so you can actually get this book online. It's free uh, for a download. I got it from the National Library of Medicine. Uh, it's 600 pages 
long. I went through the entire book looking for references to either American Indians or to slaves saying, you know, this person taught me this or that, you know, and thanking them. Absolutely no reference. He stole it all and took credit for it. Uh, the other part that's remarkable is in, in his book, there are now 37 plants that he listed uh, that are being tested for various types of medicinal uses today, primarily infections because of the rise of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Uh, and a lot of these are very, very interesting. I don't have time to cover them. Maybe they'll come up in the uh, discussion. And then the last thing I'll just say is um, bring this full circle to where we are today. Um, this is, again, a book you can download or take out of the Newcastle County Library. Uh, Gladys, and I will not pronounce this name, Tanta uh, Not She was actually a Mohegan. Heard of last of the Mohicans. That's a misspelling. Uh, that's, that's an Algonquin tribe related to the Nanticook and the Lenape. She published a book in the 1940s. Uh, she was, she got her degree, graduate degree at Yale. She was highly educated, but she interviewed the last surviving elders in what were then called the Delaware tribes. Most of these folks lived either in Oklahoma or up in Canada. Um, and uh, the thing that was remarkable there was, uh, first of all, the context in which the medications were used. Uh, you just didn't grab a plant and give it to someone like you might grab uh, medicine from the cabinet or go to the drugstore. Um, you had to have a whole healing ceremony built around it. Um, we would call that today integrative medicine or holistic care because it was things like the stresses in someone's life. Often this was interfamilial tensions and rivalries that were often the driving part of illness. Something again, we're belatedly understanding that's important to deal with. Um, they also had a very respectful approach to uh, collecting plants. Um, if we were all foraging using this approach, I wouldn't have any qualms about it. So um, here is uh, from her book, after coming upon the first plant of the variety required, he, the healer, does not gather it, but performs a ritual to appease the spirit of the plant. Upon conclusion of this rite, the medicine person seeks out another plant of the same species, which, if clean and healthy looking, is gathered. In other words, you never take up all the plants that are in the area. You always leave something behind so they can grow back and so uh, the forest was their medicine cabinet, and it was important for their survival to preserve that. Um, and um, she talks a lot in her book, not about the specific plants for specific conditions. There's a little bit of that, but mostly about the practices that were, we would call ecological stewardship today. How are we doing on time, by the way, Sally? 15 minutes? Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the ecology, and then I'm going to run through very briefly just a few plant examples, uh, mostly because we'll do that tomorrow on the trip if you have a chance to do so. Um, I asked Sally, am I going to be in trouble if I talk about evolution to this group? Somehow, I don't think so. Um, I have no idea why evolution has become controversial. Um, Theodosius Dobzhansky was actually Russian Orthodox. My wife is Russian Orthodox, and I want to tell you, they're, they're like the Marines when it comes to theology. And he wrote an um, article for a, a journal directed towards high school biology teachers, more or less saying nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And of course, he was asked, well, what about God? He says, well, why do you want to limit God? I mean, he can do anything he wants. Why do you want to limit it to what it says in Genesis? That would just be silly. But uh, I, there's no plant analog to this cartoon. Um, so I had to make one up. And, uh, you know, so, you know, when I go with Sally or others, like in the, in the Delaware Ornithologic Society, and we, we try to look at birds, and we try to understand their behavior. And again, it's through the light of evolution. You know, it's either about eating, uh, it's about surviving, and it's about reproducing. And so all bird behaviors, all animal behaviors fall into one of those buckets. You can do the same when you look at a plant. Those are the questions to ask if you're learning plants in the field. And so uh, plants don't eat like we do, they eat the sun, that's photosynthesis. And so 
when you look at what a plant is doing, what is it doing to optimize sun exposure? You know, how does it go higher to outcompete its, you know, buddies and, and, and neighbors? So that's where you get wood from. Uh, how does it place its leaves? Uh, if you learn plants, you learn something about phyllotaxy. You know, is it alternate or opposite, or are the leaves whirled? And all of that is by design to put the leaf in the best possible position to get as much sun for the total plant and not shade its fellow leaves on the same plant. Uh, and then timing, um, spring ephemerals. Um, this is not working out too well these days with lesser celandine or the early leafing out of trees. But spring ephemerals bloomed early to get the sun and they did all of their business, including reproduction, before the trees leafed out. So they had basically, there was no competition for them. They found their niche and that was how they could survive. Uh, to avoid being eaten, that's what survival is all about, deter the threats, uh, physical and chemical. The chemical we're gonna talk about. Uh, but there are other types of threats, uh, bark on trees to prevent fire. Um, plants have remarkable adaptations if they're being attacked by salt water. Uh, so you go down to Bombay Hook and look at the salt marshes. Uh, ultraviolet, uh, plants get sunburned. And if you ever see a plant looking kind of reddish, purplish, particularly like when the oaks first leaf out or the first leaves on a red maple, the anthocyanin is there for a purpose. It's to block the UV. And uh, we even see that. I, I've spent a lot of time in New England studying bog ecology and um, sphagnum that grows in a very sunny spot will be almost brilliant red. Um, and uh, if it's in a shaded area, it'll be a lime green color. Uh, and then reproduction, um, some of the same chemicals that plants use to defend themselves can also be used for attraction of pollinators uh, or um, dispersal. Uh, so you put essentially a, a sugar cookie on a seed, which is called an eleosome. The ant will grab it and then take the ant to the anthill. And basically by taking the seed, it's planting the seed. It eats the eleosome. Uh, and then various forms of vegetative spread, of course. Uh, and plants can do a lot of these things really clever because uh, they've had a long time, uh, like a billion years, you start with the algae, um, and then 400 million years for land plants, and insect warfare for 150 million years. Um, plants do funny things too. Their genomes are very different than us. If we had too many chromosomes, we would probably die in utero or have a terrible chromosomal disorder like Down syndrome. Plants don't care. Um, and so they have these extra chromosomes and duplications of genes, which gives them a chance to experiment. So, you know, they can, they can have mutations in certain genes, and most of the time the mutation doesn't work out. The other genes will take care of things, but every now and then they come upon a winner, and that's how they can create such an enormous variety of compounds. Uh, plants can also propagate from non-germ cell tissue. Uh, for us to propagate any kind of genetic change, it's got to happen in our ovaries and our testicles. Uh, if we had a mutation in a non-germ cell line, uh, we call that cancer. And for the plant, you know, a 400-year-old tree does not have the same genes coming out of its seeds as when it was 10 years old because of these non-germ cell mutations. And again, that allows more rapid adaptation and of course, um, one reason why plants can tolerate this genetic diversity is that um, the way they look, we, we have to look a certain way because of the, the, the way the genes interact and makes us symmetric with two arms, two legs. Plants can be any shape they wanna be. They respond to the sun and, and to the soil and the water. And that, therefore uh, that's allows them a great degree of flexibility. Uh, like growing on cliff faces. The last thing is they're very efficient at making chemicals. I mean, are there some DuPont retirees in this audience? There's gotta be an Arden. DuPont retirees? No, maybe not. Hercules, <laughs> AstraZeneca. All right, different crowd. Um, I mean, they, you know, DuPont can't hold a candle to what plants do. Uh, plants make incredible amount of materials through repetitive use of simple building blocks. I, I use the analogy of Legos here because that's what it is. And, and, and one of the number one Legos is 
isoprene. And two isoprenes make a terpene. And the terpenoids, um, same root that you get turpentine from, Turpentine is just a distillation of uh, terpenoids from pines. Um, they can grow incredibly big. Um, and as they get larger, they start folding in on themselves. Think of tinker toys that rotate amongst themselves and they can form ring structures. Some of these ring structures have steroid effects. So we get the precursors to our steroids and birth control pills from plants. They started out as a terpenoid and they can even get much more complex. Like um, in the late 60s, early 70s, the Vietnamese and the Chinese had a problem, which was that we were fighting a war in Indochina. What's a big problem in Indochina? Malaria. Quinine is not grow naturally. Chinchona bark is not naturally in Indochina. So the Chinese went out on a hunt for quinine substitutes. Um, and a woman botanist in China discovered an, a compound that was in the mugwort plant. We see mugwort everywhere these days. Um, that with a little bit of chemical modification to make it more stable and, and you could swallow it as a pill, became artemisinin. And, and that is the leading treatment now for quinine resistant malaria in the world. Uh, and she was finally recognized 40 years later with the Nobel Prize in 2015. Again, all work done by a plant from simple building blocks. Um, it's amazing what you can do with Legos, by the way. Has anybody seen the Liberty Bell in the, in the Philadelphia airport that's just made out of uh, Legos? So if you go to the next level, you have a group of compounds you've heard, all, heard of called polyphenols, okay? And so they all have this um, hexagonal ring structure with a, a oxygen hydrogen group of phenol. And you make different combinations of this. And one combination there in the lower left is uh, the drug that is found in St. John's wort that many people feel can be beneficial for depression. Uh, if you make things even more complicated, uh, you get things called tannins. Uh, and tannins are incredible anti bacterial compounds. Uh, and you go further still and you get something called lignin. And if you think about what wood is, um, think of something like carbon fiber. If you ever have a carbon fiber tripod, you know, the cellulose is the equivalent of the carbon fiber, the epoxy resin, that's what the lignin is. And so the plants have come up with these composite materials that are incredibly light and strong, and uh, but also protective. Lignin has antibacterial and antiviral properties. And early in the pandemic, um, people were making the mistake of doing COVID tests with nasal swabs that had wooden sticks on them. And the wood inactivated the virus. It was one of many mistakes that were made early on in the pandemic, but that was one of the lessons. And I just, I caught that briefly on a newscast when it was happening and I just got fascinated. Uh, if you have diabetes, one of these compounds by the name flor uh, fluoridzin, uh, which is found primarily in apple peels, uh, is now in a whole host of drugs that all end in uh, flozin as a suffix, um, but they basically help your body get rid of glucose in the urine, and they're fantastically effective and work in ways different than insulin. Now, um, ecologically speaking, Making this stuff costs energy. You only want to do it when you need to. And plants, like anything else, have to, they have an energy budget, just like we have a budget. And so there's a thing in here with medicinal plants called optimal defense theory. You, you protect the things that are most valuable to you. Um, in the plant world, uh, the equivalent of the laboratory mouse is uh, Arabidopsis thaliana. Uh, and you can do all kinds of things here. You can knock out genes. We know the full gene sequence of this plant. And uh, uh, what happens in the leaf is that these chemicals are synthesized, but then they are transported to the most sensitive part of the plant, which tends to be either the root or the youngest leaves. Young leaves of plants have the highest concentration of the interesting compounds. Who buys 
first flush or second flush start healing pee? You ever people get loose leaf pee? If you're a real, you're, you're a teeth aficionado. Yeah, and they're incredibly expensive because that's the first flush. You got to pull them right then. There's there's so few of them. But if you really want the taste of tea, not just the caffeine, but all the other compounds, that's what you go for. So the, the, the young leaves are the ones that have the most compound. And that's a factor if you're collecting medicinal plants for your own herbal medicine. Because if the leaves are old, it's not going to be as potent. They can knock out the gene that actually helps transport these compounds and concentrates them in the, the, the younger leaves. And when they do that, this was done a year ago, um, it turns out that uh, then the caterpillars can actually attack the young leaves because the distribution has gone awry. Uh, I just find it absolutely fascinating. And how the heck do the plants know to do that? They're smarter than we are. You have another problem when you're a plant, not just is it costly energetically to make these compounds and you want to concentrate them where they are most needed, but you don't want to poison yourself. So plants have these strategies so they don't poison themselves. They can, they can put it inside a vacuole, which is basically like a Ziploc bag inside the cell. Uh, they can put it inside a pipe that doesn't access any other part of the plant. And if the pipes have latex, they're called lacticifers. Uh, and sometimes um, when you you have a really old sweet potato in your uh, refrigerator, has this ever happened to you? You slice it down the middle and you see the oozing out of the latex. That's what's happened there. It's stored in that. Uh, you may put it out on a hair and if we're lucky, we'll find some plants that have uh, what are called glandular hairs or glandular trichomes. And it's a little bitty hair with what looks like a lollipop at the end. That lollipop is the drop of the compound that's basically meant to deter the insect that wants to eat it. But it's not gonna to touch the plant, so the plant is safe. And uh, the best defense is um, what we do with nerve gas. You know, VX nerve gas comes in, it's a binary compound. So either chemical alone is completely safe, it's only when you combine them that you create the poison. And plants do this frequently. Um, if you um, eat any plant in the mustard family, and that includes things like broccoli and Brussels sprouts, uh, you're basically, you have a situation where uh, you have an enzyme that's stored in one cell and then a precursor compound stored in another cell. And when it gets munched on by you or the insect, the cell walls rupture, they mix together and they create that kind of nasty, smelly thing, which kids don't like. So what have we done is that we've bred Brussels sprouts with less of these compounds so the kids can, everybody's eating Brussels sprouts now. Have you noticed that? Do you know what the trade-off is? If you're an organic gardener, more insect damage, more herbivory. So you, know, you think about that. Sometimes the plants that tasted not so good, maybe the kids didn't like it. You didn't have to throw so many chemicals on it. Um, lettuce, you know, lettuce is naturally quite bitter. Uh, I get my lettuce from uh, Highland Orchards and uh, I'll say, I, I like the bitterness. And as an adult, I appreciate that extra taste, but kids don't like it. But again, that's, that's how the plant is using a, a compound to deter the people that want to eat it and storing it safely for itself. And then the one that's the neatest, we'll demonstrate that tomorrow, um, is cyanide. Cyanide kills everything, but not when it's bound to a sugar. But there is in the same situation where if you take a black cherry twig and you scrape across it and you sniff it, you'll get that bitter almonds odor. That's the odor of cyanide. Um, and by the way, if it looks like a black cherry and it smells like root beer, then you're dealing with the birch. It's time to go. So anyway, we're, we're wrapping up here. And I'll just say that, uh, again, um, the same compound serves many purposes. Um, so again, these could be pigments. Um, as they could be UV blockers. They could be attracting pollinators. Um, wax is a very interesting. Um, birders appreciate the wax myrtle um, because it's what um, yellow rump warders, warblers eat. Um, 
during the fall migration and also tree swallows and perfectly timed. But that wax also contains compounds to prevent the, um, the plant being damaged by insects. And it also sheds water because if water gets on a leaf, you get fungus. So these waxes serve many purposes at all at once. And uh, I'm not gonna cover the rest because we don't have time, but I will try to walk through some of the basic plant families. Um, this is something that I think uh, Dave will make available to everybody afterward. Just if you if you need a reference, is anybody planning to do the walk tomorrow? You know, have a chance to do so. Right at the nature center. Everybody knows where the nature center is. It's going to be at nine. I may be a couple minutes late if my dentist is doesn't show up on time because I have a dental cleaning right before then. But uh, yeah. And uh, I've already scoped it out. Um, so I have a little quiz for you all here, the handout. You'll get, you'll get the answers um, when uh, you show up tomorrow. Uh, I'm allowed to copy this. This comes out of uh, Tom Epler's book, uh, Botany in a Day, and it has the major plant family. And then, uh, this is a tremendous amount of material to hold in your head. So I have a sheet for you here that I just talked about. Uh, every compound. Uh, I didn't go through the characteristic plant families and you know, which compounds exist in different plant families, but this will help us when we're out in the woods. And what else do I want to say here? Oh, I want to just end on one note. I said I was going to give a final piece of health advice. Um, I think the primary medicinal advantage of studying plants is it gets you out in nature. And this is a beautiful review, by the way, that summarized all the literature on the positive health impacts of being outdoors and in nature. Anybody who's interested, I will forward it to you. Just send me an email. Um, but you know, fresh air, physical activity. We all need more of that. Um, what did we hear just from the Surgeon General two weeks ago? Loneliness is killing people in this country. So the social interaction. So this is gonna be a social event tomorrow. Um, if you can't make it tomorrow, you know, make, there are many other field trips um, from DOS, Delaware Nature Society and the rest and stress reduction. Um, I did this as a hobby. Uh, I began in medical school birding. I probably ended up going out twice a year because I didn't have much time, but it was one way to alleviate the stress and it was my therapy. And so I recommend this to all of you. And again, lastly, just a little bit of information for the field trip. Uh, if you don't have a hand lens or binoculars, I will bring them. I, I actually bought a whole bunch of hand lenses, pretty nice ones for the field, which uh, uh, I will, uh, allow you to take as a souvenir. So questions? If you have a question, I will, uh, I'll, I'll repeat your question because it's you know, very Nothing from the zoo. Nothing from the zoo? Nothing oh. from the zoo audience. No okay. From the zoo audience. I, I thought you said zoo. George. The um, question is, are the monkey balls a natural mechanism protection from the sweet gum? Yes. Well, that's an interesting one. Now, so I, I will say this, uh, the sweet gum tree is, is, being, is one of those 37 plants that are being studied uh, for medicinal uses today out of Francis Porcher's work. Um, one thing that those um, gumballs have a lot of is something called shikimic acid. Um, you probably have never heard of that term, but how many people have heard the word Tamiflu. Tamiflu is made out of shikimic acid. Um, so it probably has that protective thing because you're protecting the family jewels, the next generation of the seeds. Uh, the other thing I find interesting as a birder is that in the fall and in the winter, uh, those are little you know, natural feeders for chickadees, for uh, American goldfinch. You'll see them hanging onto those balls and 
um, if you get them in the winter, you know, you can, you can kind of shake them and they're rattling and, and those are the loose seeds inside. And so, you know, that it, it, they're probably shaped in part to be a dispersal mechanism. They also float. So if you, they are a characteristic coastal plain tree. So if you see a sweet gum in the Piedmont um, or outside of the, you know, the fall zone, uh, it was brought there probably by another animal. It naturally, or including man, it, but it naturally belongs in the coastal plain. All right. Uh, by the way, the other monkey ball is the the the, the orange-like fruit of the uh, Osage orange. That's that's the one I grew up with, and and that was probably a dispersal mechanism for giant ground sloths that have gone away. There's a lot of adaptations that plants develop, uh, either to prevent herbivory, like the thorns on um, a honey locust, or to enhance dispersal and reproduction. Uh, and the animals have gone away, but the defenses have not. Well, thank you. That was great. All right. And I'm, I'll hang back if you have any other questions. Thank you for your attention.